All right, guys, it is now 2 p.m. and we're beginning our philosophy three hours with John here today. Say hello, John, if you may. Hello there, everyone. As you guys have remembered or may have remembered from the previous session with John, he is a PhD student right now in philosophy, did a MA in philosophy as well, and a BA in physics. Uh, his main study seemed to be well, just about everywhere. He seems to be very interested in <laughs> metaphysics, ethics, but particularly within Kantian and um, Kantian scholarship. So we're, of course, as usual with John, going to be doing some Kantian books within metaethics and ethics, and then kind of the perspectives that revolve over there. So yeah, let's begin by putting it on the uh, the general camera for discussion because we are going to go over these three books today with John and. Um, yeah, John, I guess if you want to start us off, or do you want me to sort of pose maybe some questions that generally people have, or do you want to kind of get into these three pieces of work? Yeah, let's maybe start from 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 questions that you've seen often before. That might be a good way to do it. I mean, the general question that a lot of people ask me, um, and the general people, I mean, like the general kind of question, I guess, in philosophy is talking about categorical imperatives and why we have to even believe in some form of robust moral realism. So avoiding issues of ethical skepticism with respect to categorical norms or universal norms, I think is probably something that you want to tackle with this, with this video. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> why don't you guide us through it then? And uh, what you think might be some sort of solutions to um, ethical particularism Right. So I would I would say a starting point for talking about the categorical imperative and actually even throwing Kant aside, uh, just talking in general in general about why it is that we should accept that morality has an inescapable hold over us and that just people who are skeptical of the fact that we should do what is morally right. Um, would have to recognize or at least a start at least a starting point that i think is is worth um go, going into in order to address the concerns of the moral skeptic to put it that way i mean this particular starting point that i think is is worth discussing is the a sort of common ground which is that instrumental or hypothetical imperatives and their hold over us is something which is often taken for granted and one way to understand the hold that morality has over us or to understand it being escapability of that hold in particular and why it is that the moral skeptics position is is confused or is uh, in tension with itself in certain ways is to see the way in which even instrumental imperatives which and i'll explain what i mean by that in a bit or in instrumental aughts you know that which I'll explain, uh, depend for their force on more basic non-instrumental aughts. And so in this way, the precisely the kind of thing that skeptics of morality are skeptical of, which is this, this sort of intrinsic force of what you ought to do morally, is something which they have to confront anyway, just in the accept in accepting that there are things that they instrumentally ought to do, and so that's kind of, that's that's a way in which um, I think Kant and so we have Kant's, Kant's groundwork of the metaphysics of morals on the on the on the screen there, and also Christine Korsgaard, a, a modern Kant scholar, also uh, this is an approach that both of them take to addressing the concerns of the moral skeptic. I think it's it's quite a forceful a way of approaching those concerns. Although I'll talk about some issues with it. With, with this way of approaching it that come out of the work of Bernard Williams and um, and I think and grappling with the with the tension between those 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 two approaches the one accepting that morality plays a certain certain basic role in our in our practical lives and the other accepting that our practical lives are this sort of freestanding thing which philosophy and even moral philosophy uh, can only do so much to direct us on it will be one of the main things that I want to talk about in in this discussion. So, I'll, but to, but in order to do that, I'll start with talking about what um, instrumental 
aughts are, since that's sort of the starting point for this. Now, for instrumental aughts, do they have anything to do with like uh, institutional norms or hypothetical norms? Or is that something kind of different? Institutional and hypothetical norms are uh, in are re closely related to instrumental aughts. Um, okay. We might more directly say that instru uh, instrumental ought is something like, I ought to brush my teeth to maintain good oral health, or I ought to uh, rent a car in order to get to New York or something like that. It would be something that I ought to do on the basis of something else that I ought to do right. where the thing where the thing that I ought to do instrumentally is a means towards that other end basically and then what the source and then the the big question then is of course what is this what is the sense in which I ought to pursue that the end in question okay okay yeah so that's so, that's kind of that is what I generally think of the hypothetical norm is is that uh, uh, we do x in order to do y or you know i need to um go to the gym in order to get a little bit more muscular or something like that right so yeah okay if that's what you mean by uh, instrumental norms then we're on the same page yeah so oh, someone asked is instrumental imperative different than hypothetical imperative there are uh, certainly the difference between the two i think isn't terribly important especially for what i'll be talking about or at least that I meaning i suppose it could be but um, generally speaking, there, there is at least a subtle difference, which is that a hypothetical imperative is something that you ought to do uh, on the condition that you ought to do something else. So it's, it's something that you ought to do conditionally rather than unconditionally, so that there, there, would, there would then be some cases under which you, uh, it isn't the, it, 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 under which you oughtn't do it, or at least that it's not the case that you ought to do it. Um, that, and that makes it hypothetical because it's not uh, always or unconditionally something that you ought to do. Yeah. Instrumental oughts aren't necessarily the same thing as that. They are a version of hypothetical oughts or hypothetical imperatives in that they are conditional. On, the fact that you ought to do those things in something instrumentally is conditional on it being the case that you ought to pursue the end to which this other thing is a means. But there could also potentially be hypothetical oughts which and hypoth so hypothetical imperatives, which are not instrumental. So for example, um, certain uh, things that someone ought to do will be dependent on the institutions in which they live. So if, if, you, li if you live in a society in which, um, I'm trying to think of a good example of this. If you live in a, if you live in a, if you live in a society in which people regularly, I mean, I suppose a clear case of this would be people regularly drive on the right side of the road, um, then that's driving on the right so right side of the road is something you conditionally, well, I suppose it's not, it's not, it's not, that's not an end in itself, I suppose. Maybe, I think a better example. I, let's say you live in a hunter-gatherer society in which um, hunt, uh, contributing to, no, hold on, that would be that example as well. Are you looking for an example of a hypothetical norm or an instrumental? A, norm? Hypothet a hypothetical norm that is not itself an instrumental norm. So something that you ought to do uh, conditionally, but that isn't not because you it it furthers some further end. I think of a very clear cut example of this. Well, if you can't, we can get back on that and just kind of talk about why we need to avoid both because if they are on the same in on the same um sort of uh, if they're of the same sort of nature then we just we, we we want some sort of path for the for the categorical anyway so no it's true um I, on that note that actually flash next question is pretty much exactly the direction that I was going to go next, which is that if we talk, if we think of an instrumental imperative or something that I ought to do instrumentally, then because it's, it depends in some way on the goal that I'm pursuing, the the actual normative force of that instrumental ought, the fact 
Uh, so for example, the fact that I ought to brush my teeth in order to maintain good oral health is it, the, the fact that I ought to brush my teeth is depending on the fact that I ought to maintain good oral health. And so any account of instrumental odds, and this, this doesn't get into the Kantian stuff quite yet, but any account of instrumental odds is going to be dependent on some account of non-instrumental odds. So mm -hmm. things that I uh, ought to do, even though it's not furthering some other end. Now, a non-Kantian approach to this would be to simply say that insofar as you want to do something, you simply ought to do it. So you'd have to have, you, can, you could explain the force of instrumental oughts on the basis of the fact that we ought to do what we want to do. But now, insofar as we do this, it seems that and so insofar as we take that that principle seriously that we you ought to do whatever it is that you want to do i mean whatever the intuitive merits or demerits of that and we could we could we can say that um some people find that intuitive some people find that grossly unintuitive in fact it didn't find it intuitively false even but whatever the intuitive merits of it um it <clears throat> nonetheless would be a principle if we were to answer or explain instrumental arts by that principle. It would be a principle that is as groundless and in need of justification as any moral or categorical, any moral grounding, let's say, of our instrumental, of instrumental arts, so that we might say that, so someone who indeed is skeptical of morality in general, who's skeptical of the fact that there are some things that we just unconditionally ought to do, is would be in no would have no better reason to be skeptical of morality than they have reason to be skeptical of this say uh principle that you ought to do whatever it is that you want to do and so in the in this in this way there is a place for pressing the skeptic on their skepticism of morality, because they are essentially left with, a, ex, with an acceptance of instrumental arts. I mean, and, and the, here's where maybe intu intuitions about what people ought to do would, would come into play. I mean, it, it, people find it very unintuitive to be skeptical of instrumental reasoning, instrumental normativity, that you, know, that you ought to do stuff that furthers your ends. Um, but they would be left accepting that while at the same time being skeptical of, skeptical of something that is no, at, at least as, as far as what I've said so far, that is no better and no worse grounded than those same instrumental odds. So that's not really getting into the Kantian side of this, but this, this, is, this is a kind of general approach to uh, pressing on 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 people's skepticism of morality, it's it's a general way of pressing against that. Yeah. So can you can you kind of go over that a little bit more, just kind of re clarifying it for me and the audience here? Yeah. So the idea is that if you accept the force of instrumental arts, for example, if you accept that you ought to brush your teeth to maintain good oral health, you ought to, uh, you know, buy some food if if you want, if you want, if, if uh, in order to eat, <clears throat> then you would have to accept some further ought, which is the basis for that instrumental ought. And any further ought is going to, it, it might be a moral ought, you know, I ought to mm -hmm. uh, go and, I got to go and get some food because feeding yourself is something that you morally ought to do like taking care of yourself is something that you morally ought to do or it could or you could grant or you could try to ground it in i ought to go and get some food because i want to get some food and either in either of those cases you while well, each of those pro would provide a grounds for uh these instrumental oughts they're sort of of a piece insofar as they i either 
you're skeptical of one and you're not skeptical of the other but if you're doing so then you're doing then that's a sort of arbitrariness where there's no for no reason skeptical of one more so than the other or you're skeptical of both but if you're skeptical of both of course then that undermines your lack of skepticism for instrumental auths and so there's a we might say a, a sort of dialectical or rational pressure to uh, against moral skepticism insofar as we are not skeptical of instrumental auths. It sort of leads us in that direction. Right. So if I'm understanding correctly, you're basically couching all of these hypothetical norms and so into one other type of categorical norm because we would have an infinite regress of hypothetical norms. Or, exactly. Okay, right. So what would and I'm guessing you'd also reject the idea that these hype the, the chain of hypothetical norms can be grounded in something uh non cognitive, right? Like that is to say that some sort of desire, some sort of basic desire which is just there. Or would you consider that sort of non cognitive, maybe dispositional force, that causal force to also be categorical in nature? Well, yes, yeah, so this is what leads us in, into what I think is the more interesting question, which is then how it is, how, what, what is possible or what is, how is it that we can actually ground these non-hypothetical categorical thoughts, these, these things that we simply ought to do okay. regardless of anything else. Right. And then, you, right, go and ahead. then that's where you start, can start asking questions about whether or not merely having an attitude towards something is uh, sufficient. And then if, if we want to say that, we, we'd have to have an explanation of why that is, or it would have to be the case that there is some further thing which is able to provide this regress stopping basis for further oughts or norms or imperatives, and where that further thing is independent of any attitudes that we have. And here we get into the usual subjective versus objective accounts of morality, where <clears throat> I'll discuss a little bit about uh, a Kantian approach to this, as well as a, 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 a Bernard, a, a critique in the in the vein of Bernard Williams and Nietzsche. Okay. Um, so I mean, I uh, should probably yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I, should, I just wanted to answer Arakasi, um to say that yes, that is what I meant. Okay. So yeah, I think I, I think we're on the same page then, uh, if I understand you correctly, with this infinite regress and this sort of um, grounding are hypothetical norms and something non-hypothetical. And right now we're trying to find the nature of what that type of non-hypothetical norm might be, right? So it could either be cognitive or non-cognitive. The general way that I would go about it is that it can't be non-cognitive um, just because I don't see a sort of relationship being possible between those two. Generally what's going to provide us reasons for accepting certain types of um, hypothetical norms or instrumental norms is propositional, right? It's reason giving, it's propositional, it's semantic in that sense. And therefore it doesn't seem like that reason giving force behind these other types of norms that situate our instrumental norms can themselves be non-propositional or non-cognitive. Now this might be the sort of direction that you go to, but I'm kind of curious as what the route you go with in, in your own particular philosophy. Yeah, I mean, would, would you be all right discussing what you just said a little bit further about so, the propositional nature being something that prohibits the the grounds being non-cognitive? Yeah, I I take it that if we're endorsing certain types of hypothetical norms, right, we can create a sort of disjunction, if you will, between accepting things for non-dispositional reasons or dispositional reasons, which doesn't seem to be reason giving in any sense, right? We'd be just sort of mm -hmm. expressing certain types of causal disposition, causal tendencies. And those seem to be often their own sort of mix, right? They're going to be distinct from what we do as free agents, because as free agents, we can create certain types of second order beliefs. Uh, that mm -hmm. is that we can focus on uh, what we're doing. Let's say that we're, and I, I've offered this example many times in our stream before, let's say that we're um, outside and there's a cigarette right there, right? 
and there's a sort of dispositional tendency for me to want to uh, smoke the cigarette, maybe because it brings me certain types of uh, dispositional accounts of joy and pleasure. And mm -hmm. I can have a first order belief about that in, in virtue of those types of dispositional forces. It brings me pleasure and therefore I should seek it out and I should move myself to, um, to smoke it. Or what I could do is I can reflect upon that cigarette and then think of it in terms of second order beliefs. That is thinking of it in terms of its universal uh, structure. The cigarette is not just something that brings me pleasure or joy, any of these causal tendencies, but something that relates itself to medical conditions, uh, to causing or disposing oneself uh, uh, to cancer, right? I can, I can be informed about the cigarette. And in this sense, I'm bringing up the particular cigarette to its universal content, that sort of information about the universal content of the cigarette. And I'm making, uh, I'm making more apt judgments about the cigarette then, right? I'm bringing up into the logical space of reasons to use a Salarzian term that I've employed here. Mm -hmm. um, when we do that, right, when we create these sort of second order beliefs, it seems as though we're in, we're now talking about an agent that has certain types of reflective beliefs that um, are, are, are not just causal dispositions. We're in a sort of unique sense of, agency right uh, human beings is sort of this reflective agency um, sort of self-legislating self-choosing their own um what what they wish to do with their actions so here we're sort of avoiding these causal dispositions that we enjoy normally are and i think this is sort of how it works with ethics we're not just thinking and reflecting about our passions and our desires we're creating a sort of disjunction between our passions and desires where taking certain types of ethical principles, if you will, and then universalizing them or thinking of them in a sort of reflective sense, disinterested sense is the sort of Kantian wants us to get at, or maybe Kosgaard wants to get at. Does that make some sense? Yeah, I think what that I think quite nicely points to, or at least leads into, is the idea that whatever is going to be able to provide this unconditional norm that can ultimately ground our instrumental aughts and instrumental reasoning is going to have to be the very same thing that introduces reasons into the world that makes it the case that that you know makes it the case that there is a space of reasons as as you put it in this in, the, in those Salarzian terms or that makes it the case that certain considerations or certain things in the world are related to each other by being reasons for one another where say the fact that i uh to, you know to use the example that uh, uh, edgar uh Edgar, Edgar Allan Groh said to if that you yeah, ought Edgar to go Allen through Grove. Starbucks. Yeah, Edgar Allan Groh. <laughs> That's great. Uh, it, that if you uh, ought to go to Starbucks, well, so yeah, I mean, that's more, specifically the that you ought to do what you, you ought to get yourself a cup of coffee, coffee if you desire a cup of coffee. It has to be the case that the there is some so in that case there have to be some relation between having a desire and having uh and some action say going to starbucks or getting a cup of coffee or something like that and whatever it is that makes it the case that your desire for a cup of coffee can ground further instrumental reasoning like going to starbucks it would have to be the case that there would be no rational relation between that desire and that Starbucks, unless that desire, uh, in, unless that desire were able to provide provide a, an unconditional basis for further norms. So it would have to it would have to somehow be the case that desires that the mere fact that you have a desire brings other things into a rational relation with that desire and that desires are just intrinsically reason giving in some way which would uh you know in, in many ways a question a questionable assumption um but it would have, that's just i just bring that up as an example since in order for something to put a stop to this these kinds of regresses of norms mm -hmm. like in instrumental reasoning uh it has to be the kind of thing that by its very existence or by its very presence 
introduces rational relations and that rational relations would be impossible without right. that reasons right. reasons and the entire space of reasons would be impossible without that thing right and that's why i think that dispositional properties due to them being definitionally um, non-cognitive and non-propositional couldn't entertain that type of force right they need to be propositional in origin and this might be where we're kind of going um, this is where you might be taking this but I see a sort of Kantian route here is that we're trying to find the unconditional in our rationality right oh thank you for following by the way um, we're trying to find the unconditional source uh, of reason I guess within well that's constitutive of our agency right Mm -hmm. um, that would ground all of the possible types of hypothetical norms um, yeah. that one has to offer. Now, presumably, we're doing this in a way that avoids another type of relativism, because presumably there isn't an unconditional ground within every subject that's distinct, right? You're basically saying that in virtue of us all having reason, that there is one type of categorical norm that's constitutive of all human agents. Yeah, that would be what would be required to have a universal morality. And so certainly a lot of these at different stages of identifying unconditional or categorical norms, you might identify different degrees of objectivity, we might say. So there on the one hand, there's a talk of whether or not something an unconditional norm would be mind independent. So if, if desires were that unconditional norm or a principle that you should do what you want to do would be with that unconditional norm, then the unconditional norms would not be mind independent. They would depend on people's attitudes. Moreover, but even if they were mind independent, I should say, then it might still be the case that different people instantiate that mind independent feature in different ways. And that this principle then applies differently to different people. And if that were the case, then there wouldn't be a, un any universally categorical or universally unconditional norms. And you would be let and any morality based on that would then be a non universal universal or relative morality um and of course of course kantians are going to go to go go to the further point of saying it, it is a um mind well mind independent yeah it's mind independent in some sense it's mind and it's mind dependent in a different sense but certainly not attitude de dependent let's put it that way and it is, and it is, and it morality is also something which is universal. The the, the moral norms are, are norms that apply universally to all people by virtue of something that all people have in common, namely their status as rational agents. Right, 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 right. I think I think I'm following so far where you're where you're getting at with this. This is a sort of this is a sort of Kantian um, mix uh, of philosophy. Um, I'm trying to think of any sort of objections to this other than, of course, going on to a form of ethical robust realism that doesn't depend on the subject. But I'm guessing what you're eventually what makes this theory palatable, what makes it sort of justified is this sort of regress into an unconditional principle that's found in reason itself. Um, because if it wasn't found in reason itself, if, if there wasn't something within the cognitive apparatus that we have that's universal, it would either have to be in our nature or in the world. But if it's in the world, then the argument generally that I see, and I think uh, Schaefer actually, Landu Schaefer brings this up in his book on moral realism, is going to say something like, it opens up the possibility of those moral uh, values that exist outside. That is, if we're moral realists and there are actual objective properties outside within the world that are non-naturalizable, mm -hmm. would have to somehow be um, gotten, gotten to without then using any sort of characteristics or any sort of properties of the subject that wouldn't then tie it relatively to that subject, right? To the, as in, like, the subject has to have a certain type of sensitivity in order to apprehend the values, and then mm -hmm. we'd have to find out, well, what type of sensitivity is the correct sensitivity? And that doesn't seem to be possible without some sort of internal uh, universal criterion, right? Because then anyone could have just a sort of relativistic sensitivity to these types of moral values that exist within the world. 
Yeah. Now that kind of mind independent non-naturalism is something which something which I, I would say is not you're, we would not be led to by this line of argument. But in particular, this line of argument where, where we search for a regress stopping norm or regress stopping reason uh, would actually, I think, militate against the positing of these of the kinds of non-natural properties that Schaefer Landau posits, pr 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 specifically because the kind of non-natural properties that Schaefer Landau posits, you know, as you were describing, are not ones that, in that depend for their existence on the existence of the agents for whom they provide reasons. And so in that way, the existence of these non-natural normative properties, these reasons, reasons or reason giving things that are out in the world independently of us is separable from the existence of us, from the existence of not, not just us specifically as humans, but the existence of rational agents. Yeah, but the, agents. yeah, sure. But just, just so I can give the straightforward argument that generally oh, yeah. the, the moral particularists, that is the, the, the moralist who basically thinks that this is going to be individuated to the subject is basically saying these following four things, according to Landu Schaefer. Obligation entails reasons. Reasons must be capable of motivating. Motivational mm -hmm. capacity is relative to attitudes. Therefore, obligations are relative to attitudes. Um, so that's the thing that sort of needs overcoming is this sort yeah. of relativity towards attitudes or dispositional attitudes, whatever you want to call them, right? If they're propositional or dispositional, I don't think it really matters. Yeah. So did you, did, I, sorry, did I cut you off or did you kind of finish your thought there? Um, I, I was thinking going a little bit further mm -hmm. to, because I think, yeah, I, well, I maybe to build on what you just said and, and to continue on to what I, what I, what I was thinking, Oh, it's okay. You don't have to build on what I said. So. Oh, no, but it, it's, it's actually works out quite nicely because I, I think it does show that there is a sort of dilemma in trying to uh, argue for any given position on what the grounds of morality is. Because on the one hand, there is the kind of concern, which I think which I think is nicely captured by the argument that you just presented, which is a, generally an argument for some kind of attitude dependence, as you said, which is that there has to be some way in which something which is normative for us, something which gives us reasons, is able to uh, motivate us and drive us to action. And then on the other hand, there is this further tension, which of course the moral skeptic, skeptic doesn't feel, but there's nonetheless this further tension that what gives us reasons is able to do so in a way that isn't just by motivating us or even isn't just by uh, activating our dispositions towards certain kinds of behavior, say. Mm -hmm. it, it's something that operates on us in, in a more than just causal dispositional way. It acts on us in a genuinely reason-giving way. Right. And so this, there's, this, there seems, there's an enormous tension, I think, and it's one of the most fundamental tensions in metaethics between these two uh, desiderata, these two things which seem desirable for any account, not just of morality, but of normativity and reasons in general. On the one hand, it should be able to motivate us. On the other hand, it shouldn't be able to just, it shouldn't just be able to motivate us. It has to go, it has to be able to take us from mere motivation, mere causation, activation of dispositions up to uh, actually giving us reasons. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I do like the, the way that you sort of summarize this disjunction between motivation and then also from what I take it to from what you're saying is categorical motivation of a sort that isn't relying upon attitudes, dispositions, and things like that. Yeah, exactly. This now this leads quite nicely into the tent, the sort of conflict or debate between people like Bernard Williams uh, and uh, people like Christine Korsgaard, or Kantians in general, since what both of them ha share in common and that they would both disagree with say Schaefer Landau, for example, and a lot of other non-natural realists, these sort of really robust realists, is that the way of resolving this tension 
has to continue to take both sides of the dilemma, or you know, the, the two things that are in tension, has to continue to take both of them very seriously and actually and cannot sacrifice one or the other um, in order to, uh, oh no, sorry, I was saying both sides. The Kantians want to say both sides cannot be sacrificed. Bernard Williams in particular will, wants to say that the motivational side of this cannot be sacrificed. But in this respect, he agrees with the Kantian. So that was very poorly phrased. No, no. Uh, but the, the basic idea here is that all this talk about motivation, this talk about the need for the things that give us reasons to also give us, also motivate us, is really a question of, when we apply this to morality, it's really a question of the grip that morality has on us. The way in which uh, what is morally right or wrong cannot simply be some alien force that even if it motivates us, does so by a sort of coercion. It sort of makes us do uh, act on it when it because of some, let's say, some faculty for intuiting that something is morally right or wrong. You know, we just see that it's right or wrong by some sort of power of intuition, and that just drives us in a motivational sense to act on uh, what that moral norm requires. At least if it's not overridden by some by something else, or if our rational capacity to intuit this is not defective in some way. So the, the idea is that both the Kantians and, and people like Bernard Williams, I might say Nietzscheans in some sense, take very seriously this idea that we cannot simply be coerced by the things that we ought to do into following them. There has to be uh, this actual grip, this sort of intimacy of the things that are reasons for us, that there really are reasons. They're not just these alien reasons that make us do things. Um, and this is why I, I in particular find these Kantian approaches like that of Korsgaard to be so much more compelling than approaches like that of Schaefer Landau or David Enoch or others who are on a, in a more sort of, who make reasons into something which is completely mind independent, which is, which is completely and in every way separate from the existence of rational agents. Mm. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure about Bernard Williams, but generally, when I read about moral realism, it's not. I mean, certainly they have some sort of moral independence to them in the in the sense that if there were no rational agents around, right, we can consider that counterfactual scenario. Mm -hmm. um, that does not mean that there is no relationship between the subject reasoning about these sorts of things or they have no sort of relation to you know how we think or the sort of structure of our minds right uh I, I i'm not certain if i see that within a lot of robust ethical realists um i see that you know one of the problems and i don't want to i don't want to hold up the conversation too much I, one of the sort of problems that i do see with mcdowell is that he endorses the idea that values actually exist within the world in some sort of sense. Mm -hmm. um, but then he's, he, he wants to at least argue against moral anti-realism, but, and in, in that sense, endorse moral realism, but it's not a robust form of moral realism. So I can see the problem with someone like McDowell, but I'm not sure if that's quite exactly what I see within every single moral realist theory. Uh, that is like saying that there's some sort of asymmetry between human reasoning and human agency and or or you know our cognitive capacities and how the structure of moral values exists within the world are uh yeah huh that, that's interesting in because i i do see mcdowell and and, and other solarzians as having a slightly as far as ro robust realists go as having a slightly better time we might better time we might say uh accounting for the grip that reasons have on us in within a, a framework of robust realism you know where as, as you say reasons just exist in the world they're they're sort of out there it, and 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 somehow or another get their grips on us um mainly because mcdowell and other solarzians do see the space of reasons as intimately tied up with the we might say the perception, the perception, and perceptual capacities of rational agents, mm -hmm. so that the some some there there's a sort of um, you know McDowell in one of his earlier papers refers to uh, 
reasons as uh, secondary qualities that they that they they are things that exist in the world, but they exist in the world only in relation to um, rational agents who, who who perceive them and are capable of perceiving them, but can still fail to perceive them, of course, as reasons. And I think that puts in his kind of position. And he's he's diverged a little bit in, in later works, but it puts his kind of position, his yeah, his views in a better position to. Uh, address this worry that I think afflicts a lot of robust realists, more realists, which is this worry that the existence of reasons out in the world independently of us makes them an alien force that only gets its grip on us by coercing us. Mm -hmm. Well, I, there's, mean, yeah. I guess we'd have to, we'd have to talk about the nature of coercion in that sense. Um, I think I get what you're saying and I definitely, you know, people have to put certain things in a certain perspective for you to begin looking in the type of literature within within the type of vocabulary that you're phrasing things. So mm -hmm. I haven't done that, so I don't know exactly what McDowell would say about things that you exactly have just stated in that sense about the nature of coercion and the nature of motivation. But, you know, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm definitely willing to learn what you're, because it's interesting, right? It's interesting what you, so far of what you've had to say, so... Yeah, oh, I, I, I highly recommend his values and secondary qualities paper. That's that's a wonderfully short, very short paper, but wonderfully argued paper, extremely unclear, poorly written, but I think wonderfully short and yeah, makes his point I think quite I, quite I'm, strongly. I'm familiar with that paper and it's and it's been argued just to be oh. a form of moral realism, like it's just a form of endorsing a form of moral realism, not necessarily moral universalism, but but we'll we'll mm -hmm. we'll get onto that later. Let's just continue this uh, Bernard Williams Kant and Kuzgard kind of perspective, and where you were talking about the nature of motivation, what they have to say, since since you have yeah. perspectives there. So I'll talk a little bit more about Bernard Williams, especially because this will answer one of I'm I'm I feel like I'm neglecting the chat a bit, but it'll answer one of Agnes Domini's questions, which is what are the limits of philosophy, and what what does Bernard Williams have to say about ethics and the limits of philosophy in particular. And the basic worry on William's side against, you know, against, and Kantians, of course, would disagree with this, but the basic worry is that in order for something to be a reason for us in a way that gets, really gets a grip on us, one that doesn't just simply coerce us to, to follow it, if it even succeeds in making us follow it, is that there is this uh, maybe to actually rephrase this as a, in the way that I was thinking, um, something can only avoid coercing us if it lines up with with our desires in some way. That unless we feel the pull in this sort of emotional um, sense, in in an emotional sense of pull, right? You really feel drawn to acting in a certain way let's say if it's if it's you you have a reason to donate to charity say you really feel drawn to helping others by donate by donating then then the thing which is supposed to provide a reason for us if, if it's not if it's not providing us a reason in that way by really making us by really uh instilling in us this 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 pull this, this genuinely emotional pull not just a coercive pull like you really feel that you should do this and you really feel feel that feel feel strongly about it maybe not say strongly but you know you you genuinely sincerely desire it then that source of reasons will automatically uh be be coercive in the ways that uh that he that he's concerned with it'll just be some it'll be this this kind of force outside of you which just comes in and uh <clears throat> ostensibly is, is, is providing you with a reason and his, so his worry here is then that argument rational arguments the kinds of uh arguments that you that you can that you seek to provide in philosophy the kinds of um arguments that really depend on propositions that are that really depend on the acceptance or rejection of particular propositions that that the the force the non-alien force that those can have on us is completely limited to what 
gets a grip on or, or, or hooks up with what we already are feeling prior to receiving those arguments. So prior to being presented with arguments, if I don't have any feelings towards other people, I'm just completely sociopathic with no, and I, I feel no, no sympathy or pull or you like sympathy, compassion, benevolence, any, any feelings of those sort towards others, then no amount of argument could ever um, be able to move me in without coercion. It would always have to um, somehow be, say, backed up by genuine physical force, for example. Um, and, and he's, of course, saying this with from a very, I think, uh, intimate perspective. He, he's, you know, he grew up in World War II. He saw what happened in, in, uh, at the time, at the time to many academics in Germany. He, 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 he how could one, he, he was very attentive to, you know, the fate of, for example, Moritz Schlick, one of the logical positivists in the Vienna circle who was, um, you know, killed by one of his students for, um, for the things, precisely the things that he was teaching. And I'm trying to remember which, in which work of Bernard Williams, he, he talks about this, but he describes the sort of plight of, philo of the philosopher in some ways as being someone who, no matter how well you could possibly argue for various things, if it's, it's not going to protect you when, I forget how he puts it, the, you know, they st break down the door and drag you off and break your, break, break, you know, stepping on your glasses as they pull you away. If there's no, that argument can't actually help you there. And that's, and that is the limit of philosophy in, in some, in some sense. But this very intimate perspective that he has on this kind of problem is not just a trivial claim that people can just force you to do things, but it's actually that you, there is always going to be a dependence of argument on how the other people actually feel, just their actual emotional, internal dispositions, we might say. And of course, this view is very anathema to the kinds of uh, realism that you're talking that, you, that, that you're talking about before, um, but that that's the limit of philosophy and argument. That's definitely interesting. I just briefly, uh, John, I just wanted to thank uh, Bidzud, uh, Bidzud for with the with the rate of twenty three people. We're definitely up to uh, forty people now uh, in terms of who are watching our stream. Oh. Yeah, so we have uh, we have a little bit more people interested in metaethics and ethics and categorical norms, I guess. Um, yeah, but 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 please continue unless you wanted to start answering some some of the questions here. Yeah, um, I wanted to get get into the chat a bit, and see what people have been saying. If we can go up a little bit to where we were originally, because I think El uh, Egner Allen Grow asked a few questions originally. Um, yeah, maybe let's let's start from the stuff from what's been said about what 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 we were just talking about and then we can move up to because it'll keep the context of agnes domini's question more in view um and i think my answer to this will be quite quick um yes it's on bernard williams view reason and desire collapse into one another and you only have a reason a genuine reason to do something insofar as it it somehow it has as he, as he puts it in a, in a, in a paper, another paper not in that book it ha the what it, what can be a reason for you has to be connected to what you want or what how what you feel strongly about what you care about and so on by what he calls a sound deliberative route so it's only by uh if if deliberation can lead you to uh accept something genuinely and, and sort of authentically as a reason that something can be a reason for you. So in his view, reason and desire, I mean, desire is a bit of a, a technical word, but you know, reason and how you feel, what's, what you care about and so on, ha, uh, do come together. So the way the way that I'm seeing the, the sort of solution that you have, since we kind of want to eventually get into this, and I'm guessing this is sort of Cosgard's reply to this, I haven't read her, so mm -hmm. maybe you could tell me, is this that the sort of uh, the, the the attitude that one has, right, in order to be attuned or have a certain type of sensitivity to reasons, 
so they're motivated by those reasons, uh, is going to be in a sense constitutive of the agent, and therefore you're going to be arguing for some form of constitutivism in ethics. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And I can talk a little bit about more more about what that is maybe after after we've addressed more, I suppose, of the chat. So let me just real quick put up the argument that we're. I mean, I I think at least this sort of summarizes the argument that we're going against here and that we've been talking about. <laughs> and this was, this was by, uh, this was written by Schaefer right here. <clears throat> ah, Schaefer Lando. Yeah, this this argument was written by Schaefer, and this is the sort of one I'm guessing we're going against, right? Obligation entails reasons. Reason is supposed to be capable of motivating motivational capacities relative to attitudes and therefore obligation is relative to attitude and here you're saying the attitude that we one has as a moral agent has something constitutive to it that would one that would compel those reasons uh to being motivating right if i'm understanding that yeah exactly that um there is the how i would phrase this would depend on how I, how would each of those terms gets interpreted. But if, if, if I were to say that the problematic uh, premise there is the third one, that motivational capacity is relative to attitude, let's say, um, we might, the way I would uh, put my problem with this, with this argument is that uh, certain kinds of creatures, self-conscious creatures, have motivational capacities that are not attitude dependent or that are not relative to the attitudes that they in fact have and that indeed are uh constitutive features as you as, as, as you put it of both themselves but specifically uh, but also them, themselves as self-conscious creatures as creatures that are capable of reflecting on their own thoughts rather than just having those thoughts that are capable of reflecting on what they want rather than just wanting things that 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 the very structure of that provides not only reasons and it's what what and is what uh, Korsgaard uh, believes is the source of reasons but also provides motiv uh, motivational force that's capable of motivating us okay. let's go on to some of the I guess other questions here yeah um presumably one of the most important objections is we can ground instrumental reasons while still maintaining that reasons are relative i think we've already kind of addressed that though and therefore don't provide a plausible foundation for morality yeah that's certainly still available on the with the regress argument that we were discussing earlier it's still even if the, the even if the regress argument gets off the ground that we have to somehow avoid a regress of reasons a further uh, ends that we are, are doing other things for the sake of that it could still end up on at least on, as far as that goes being something relative that grounds those uh, that stops the regress basically and so like for example it could just be desires in the way that Bernard Williams thinks that it is or or that Richard Joyce thinks that it is I remember there being also one comment here saying that the, we have a sort of presumptuous theory of motivation and that reasons aren't, that just throwing away desires isn't necessarily how we should um, deal with ethics. Although I don't think that that's what we're saying here. We're basically saying reasons are in fact motivating and that sometimes we can create a separation between dispositional forces that motivate us into acting a certain type of way and then reason giving maxims that we abide by as moral agents that we self legislate upon ourselves. So there are going to be certain types of uh, certain times of where um, we might have a very uh, strong desire to commit something unethical, and that's just going to be, that's just going to sometimes occur, right? Uh, when certain types of dispositional urges override our uh, ethical capacities. But in that sense, I think we should create a sort of disjunction. Maybe you disagree, John. Um, a disjunction between not acting, actually, 
according to one's free will as an agent and acting mm -hmm. as an agent, right? So there's a sort of thick separation between that um, when we act just in, in virtue of our desires without any sort of reflection upon the ethical that we're not acting as agents altogether. Or would you think that that's a little bit strong of a claim? No, I think that would be the direction that you would have to go in order to avoid just dismissing desires altogether. Right, right. Um, yeah. And this is the sort of Kantian direction, right? The, the sort of disjunction between reasons and desires. In a sense, yes. So certainly the, the a, a, a typical way of framing Kant's position is that the thing that when we have a reason to do something, that reason not only has a source that's independent of desires, but that excludes desires entirely, that we, um, you know, there's the classic example from the groundwork of, of the metaphysics of morals, where he talks about a grocer who charges fair prices because of a uh, love of his fellow man. He just sort of has a benevolent disposition. And he just, and Kant describes that grocer as not acting on uh well first first of all not acting on his obligation to towards others and also not as not um i mean we might say in the language that we've been using not acting on reasons he's simply inclined to help others and simply helps others out of that inclination mm -hmm. and this suggests that there actually has to be um and then he and the contact gives another famous example of somebody who avoids committing suicide not you know who hates who hates his life w w wants nothing more than to kill himself but in the exclusion uh, to the exclusion of all of those feelings nonetheless avoids committing suicide and that it's only at that point once that person it's that person you know at, at earlier in, the, in his life uh loved life and didn't commit suicide for that reason quote unquote reason you know just was simply motivated not to commit suicide but then suddenly doesn't commit suicide despite how badly he wants to commit suicide, it's only at that point, Kant says, that this person has acted on reasons, has done, uh, fulfilled his obligation to preserve his own life. And all of that kind of language strongly suggests this picture. And this is, this is, this is a common view of Kant, at least outside of modern Kant, Kant scholarship, as a sort of stereotypical view of Kant, that this suggests that uh, Kant sharply separates desires and reasons that you either are acting on reasons or you're acting on desires and that if you're acting on desires you in fact by that very fact are not acting on, on reasons anymore you're simply acting unfreely you're just driven along by um how it is how it is that you feel but uh, more recently in the last 20 or 20 or 30 years this view of Kant has, has started to fall uh fall by the wayside or been rejected um for very um, partially for the, for reasons that court court courts got argues for there's a number of other Kant scholars Barbara Herman, um, I believe Mary Gregor herself had this view you know the famous translator of Kant, um, but there's 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 a, there's a view that what we what we have rather than this sharp exclusion between desires and reasons is more like a um, a, 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 sh a sharp difference between two kinds of, as Kant would put it, interests, two kinds of uh, interests that we have, where one is a, we might say, I'll put this in non-Kantian language, so in language that Kantians wouldn't be using just to keep it close to what we've been talking, the way we've been, we've been talking. But that basically we have some desires which we simply have, which they say we're simply as dispositions, you know, we're just driven, we just feel uh, like doing something or want to do something, and we're simply moved to do it on that basis. Mm -hmm. Then we have other desires, just to put this in really stark terms, we have other desires which, which we might call rational desires, which um, likewise move us in that intimate way, in that fully, you know, we feel strongly about it about what you're doing and you and, and indeed this it, it'd be right to say you want to do it um except that 
we don't simply want to do it, we have a sort of self-conscious endorsement of our wanting to do it and are doing it. And it's and we want to do it indeed precisely because of that self-conscious endorsement, that that kind of sure. reflect reflective endorsement. Yeah. This I can't remember what the, the terminology was, but I think conscious called a moral feeling. Is that what you're talking about? Exactly, yeah. Moral feeling or moral interest. Right. And for Kant, he does think that, wow, maybe I'm wrong about this, but as I recall within the metaphysics of morals, or the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, he, he, mm -hmm. he thinks that we can sort of, I don't, know, I don't know if I want to use the word intuitive, but maybe intuitively see the distinction between when we're driven by one type of desire and when we're being driven by moral feelings and such, such things as that, right? That these are sort of clear to us when we're acting in accordance with one set of rules as opposed to the other set of rules. But yeah. I'm wondering now then, and maybe you don't have a reply to this, but there might be someone who says, well, uh, how do you know, how does one know when they're acting in accordance with their dispositional desires, such as, you know, I like coffee, I like cakes, I like to, or maybe some sort of heinous crimes, I like to, you know, uh, commit acts of violence. Uh, and then when I'm acting in according to in accordance with moral feelings, how how does one create a falsification criterion for that, or is there no such thing as a falsification criterion, and we just having and we just have to sort of give up on that way of thinking, and instead just say that there's something constitutive of our experience that makes it imminently known to the experience of which we're acting upon this and that. Because I do often think that we're, we're fooled by different types of forms of feelings that we think are motivating us to act in a, a good way, but the moral feelings end up being um, not that. Yeah, and that, that's something actually that Kant would agree with, um, and that I agree with as well. He is very careful to say that... Um, I say careful as though, as though this is, involves requires subtle distinctions within his system, but he uh, he does say in the groundwork and in this famous passage in in the Critique of Practical Reason that um, we cannot merely by looking at um, someone's maxims or behavior. So whether you're ref you're reflecting on your own maxims and have access to them in that way, or simply looking at somebody's behavior and judging their behavior in that way, we it, we can't normally tell whether or not they are acting on their obligations or merely acting according to inclination that they're just pulled along by how they feel and not and not self consciously it, it, uh, endorsing and uh, the, how their feelings and their actions and acting for that because they self-consciously endorse it and so and so do it for, and so act freely um that the, it's, it's only in those situations that uh that he describes so like the person who doesn't commit suicide despite how badly he wants to how badly he wants to end his life it's only in those situations when we can we can see without a doubt that somebody is acting as they ought to do, that they are genuinely acting on their moral obligations. It, it has to be when the the moral feeling, the moral interest that we have in an action is completely and utterly in conflict with all of our other feelings. It's only then where we can, without a doubt, see that someone is genuinely acting. Uh, as they ought to do. In the Critique of Practical Reason, the famous passage I referred to is this, the one we talked about, the fact of reason, where the one of the facts, I mean, it, both in, in a general sense and in the sense that Kant, Kant, Kant puts it, that ground, that, that shows his system to be right. Um, and he's thinking here against someone who will say that we can only act on uh, desires, what, of, of some sort is precisely those situations where um, we have nothing, there's nothing counting in favor of what we're doing other than that we ought to do it. Um, but that's, those are very unique cases and he perfectly and he completely admits that this is 
off, this is typically just not the case. Typically, as we do things, we uh, it's actually quite hard to tell why someone's doing it, what their actual uh, what the actual basis of their action is, whether it's inclination or, or obligation, um, and that this is something that we just have to deal with as we judge each other and uh, interact with each other in, in in the world. Okay. Okay. Um, and there is one more thing, but I, I think I might have a response to this myself. So I, I one time, and I brought this up with Rem, but one time someone gave me the objection to this sort of infinite regress of hypothetical norms. Maybe we have to talk about this a little bit more. Is that uh -huh. there could be some sort of um, there could be something to end that regress that could appear as though it's a, a categorical norm and that functions in the same way as a categorical norm but not but might not ontologically be a, a categorical norm mm -hmm. um so we act as if though we're obeying some sort of principle and even though that we don't but i mean well I, I guess before i kind of respond to that do you think you have an objection to that or does that just seem sort of to confuse the issue even further um, I think it actually brings out precisely what it, something would need to be in order to be a categorical norm. And it, it, it shows the, uh, I mean, maybe I'll just, give, did you want to give your, your objection to it first or should, or can I go ahead with giving, giving what I think is mistaken about that, that line yeah. of argument? Well, to me, it seems as though if you're, it just confuses the sort of nature of, of of categorical norms if something does end the regress to it right then it's not just a matter of contingency it seems to be by its very nature a matter of necessity and so right. it can't just appear that way it has to legitimately be that way because if it was just appearing that way then you haven't answered the question whatsoever but i don't know if there's an objection to even that reply I think that's a good way to put it, and I think it can be we can that kind of objection to, to the argument that you described can be further strengthened strengthened not by not appealing not to the to necessity because when, when we're talking about necessity, that often brings to mind some sort of just oh it's just is true or it's just logically true or it's just metaphysically true or something like that. It's just part of the furniture of the world in some way. But to see it to say that in order for something to be a categorical norm, it would have to somehow be constitutive of normativity in general, that they would have that the only consideration that could possibly be a categorical norm would be something who that is that is something that is necessary for things to be normative at all, for things to be a reasons at all. Right. Modally necessary. Right. That's that's sort of my counter objection to that. Uh, as well um i guess this sort of leads and, and sorry you know, i'm just kind of thinking about various types of objections what about just the just the person that wants to just either deny the idea that there is something constitutive about oneself that propels these norms or at least ask this person asking you, well, what are the reasons we have to think that something is constitutive like this? Is just is it just an a priori deduction of some sort? Is there any sort of non-question begging way of proving that these sorts of things exist? Yeah, that's um, I think a good a good response on a skeptic's part. Um, on the one hand, I do I do think that at some point. You know, sort of, sort of along the lines of Bernard Williams, there is a, there is just going to be a point at which argument does cease to work against someone, and so in that sense, of course, people will be able to simply obtusely not see something as a reason, um, and even indeed see something of, as a reason that it, where, where that thing is constitutive of reasons in general that it is something 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 is can only be a reason if it, if it has that feature say yeah um, because because here we're quickly getting into i think very difficult territory with respect to philosophy one could deny the moral practical faculties of some sort 
exist and that they're constitutive of that and sorry they're not constitutive of reason that could just say well I, I just don't see it right um i was but i was having a conversation with one of my friends daniel um who brought up a pretty good point not the daniel that i was going to talk to tonight but another type of daniel who was um in mm -hmm. who's doing studies basically or just finished his phd in linguistics he basically said, well, now we're getting into sort of theories of rationality and sort of what constitutes rationality. And here, if someone wanted to go as far as to deny practical reason or some sort of normative web of reasons and just say, OK, well, I don't believe in some in any forms of constitutivism, then they're going to have to give some sort of non question or at least maybe they have to give some sort of form of non-question uh, begging arguments for what their theories of rationality could be. And once we get into theories of rationality, it only seems as though one can rely on intuition for those forms of justification, to, unless you, agree, you disagree with that. Because to me, it seems as though theories of rationality are extremely historical. We could, therefore side with Humean forms of rationality and just say, okay, well, morals are just dependent upon our sentiments. And, you know, mm -hmm. if we change your sentiments, then we change your morals. Um, but really, the only people who believed in this theory of rationality are, you know, some contemporary philosophers of ethics, some sort of moral relativists of the day, a few people historically, but a lot of the British empiricists believe this. But you, know, you get the German mm -hmm. idealists, you get Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, and their intuitions didn't line up with the form of a, ra a theory of rationality that only posited the idea that um, we should believe in epistemic norms and not uh, and not uh, moral norms, right? That seems to be more of a claim of I'm just going to arbitrarily or intuitively select one or the other when we get to that point, or we see the sort of practical force of an of a, a sort of constitutivist notion that we're remarking on here, right, and kind of go from there and maybe see what types of problems it has. So one might sort of reply to this objection as, you know, it not being necessarily fair because we're at, at the bottom right here relying on some sort of intuitions. Or would you um, discard the idea of um, needing intuitions altogether when constructing a theory of rationality? Yeah, I would, I would definitely go in that direction. I think if insofar as we can even, even view intuitions as having any, any epistemic force, as giving us, us epistemic reasons to, to accept some theory of practical reasons or accept, some, accept that something is an obligation of ours, uh, we would, even those very intuitions would be depending on some prior grounding in uh, what is constitutive of being a reason in the first place. Right. And this is the sort of problem I see sometimes that's brought up. As much as I, I, I tend to use intuitions as a last resort, because if you're in any sense a coherentist, you see that reasons are always built upon prior beliefs, right? Presumably justified true beliefs. And those are relying upon a battery of other types of beliefs. Um, and that's what we constitute as knowledge. But if you really look at it, right, if, wanted, if someone wanted to, and someone's done this to me, basically Daniel did this to me, someone sort of pressed that issue and, and say, okay, well, we, we could say that knowledge is just justified true belief, and we could just say that knowledge is basically just has to do with propositional attitudes and things like that, or propositional statements. But, uh, yeah, knowledge, I did that on purpose, by the way, with Tashi. But... Um, but, but do animals really have knowledge in that sense? Well, probably not. They pro they probably can't reason propositionally. We have no evidence to s suggest that they can. Um, certainly ants can't. Certainly fish can't. Um, mm -hmm. But they seem to be participating in something that we call knowledge. And in this sense, it doesn't seem inferential or has anything really to do with the type of justification that we're ordinarily settled within in um in philosophy right but you nonetheless have some sort of theory of rationality of how the animal is working and obtaining knowledge within the world um and that might not be purely causal right they might be dealing with concepts but not propositions 
And so maybe mm. to entertain this type of skeptic, right, you could just sort of incredulous, incredulously kind of push them into the direction like, okay, well, we can think that practical reason isn't constitutive of us, but, you know, who's, but why, why would we grant just that theory of rationality? I mean, why do we think that knowledge is only a species of propositions? Look at animals, right? Look at anything that seems to be behaving in a certain type of uh, goal-directed manner but isn't necessarily of the same type of built or same type of nature as human beings are. And presumably within even, well, maybe, and then this is more speculative, and certain types of animal uh, families, right, we do see some mm -hmm. form of morality uh, being spun there. Uh, I don't know if that's just based upon um, sentiments, for the for the animal or not or certain types of causal dispositions i actually don't have an explanation for what's going on there though mm -hmm. so, yeah i certainly think we'd want to be careful oh sorry yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Go, no, go ahead that was that was basically it <laughs> uh, yeah no i i think that's a that's a that's a that's a line of thought that i think has to be entered into because we in order to understand ourselves and what reasons are for us and what morality is for us we have to understand how it comes out of similar or even the same uh, kinds of systems or kinds of features of other creatures. And I think that's, so we absolutely have to think of that in that way if we want to understand this. But I do also think that we want, we would have to be careful about treating things which are outwardly similar or even, you know, in, internally similar in the sense of uh, involving precisely the same kinds of dispositional capacities that we have um, and treating those things as the same in the relevant respects as what uh, humans and maybe some, uh, again, like where to draw the line is difficult, maybe chimpanzees and bonobos or certain kinds of creatures, that's the, the, the capacities that those creatures have. Since when you talk about seeing morality in other animals, for example, I mean, we think of, let's say, elephants who will um, not just help slower members of the herd, but will even mourn the loss of, 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 of certain members of the herd. You know, that's, that's suggestive of caring, of caring about one another, and it's suggestive of, um, you know, both in a forward-looking and in a backward-looking sense, especially as, as grief and, and regret suggests, more backward-looking. Um, and that these are exactly the kinds of things that humans experience and we should and we should see this as the same as at least in those respects as what humans feel but then insofar as it this kind of behavior counts as uh moral behavior insofar as this kind of kind of behavior counts as rational behavior or, be, or acting on reasons um there might be and a further feature which when we, when we have the same experience as when we experience grief for the loss of another, for example, uh, is added on top of that experience that we share with other, with other animals. So that, for example, if there is a, and, and precisely not just that it's added on top of what we share with other animals, but that it's actually what makes it the case that uh, our experiences are experiences of things as reasons, right? That the loss of another is a reason to grieve. It's not, it doesn't just cause me to grieve, for example. Um, if, if, if what distinguishes us cognitively from other animals is precisely what it makes things reasons, then there can be a completely identical behavior, or at least identical in, in, in many ways, and likewise identical in, in, internally, like, you know, feature things that are identical internally in the sense of felt emotions and so on, which, uh, and this, these two things can be the same across humans and say elephants, for example, and yet there would still be uh, what we would be seeing in, in uh, non-human or maybe non-primate animals would still not count as uh, acting on or feeling things for reasons, um, you know, acting morally, say helping another, uh, in a, in a way which is suggestive of morality. Um, but really what that comes down to is whether or not there in fact are those cognitive differences. So for example, if things being a reasons depended, depends on self-consciousness of a certain sort, and 
uh, if, if that's the case, well, that self-consciousness in being uh, reflective in being higher order would have to involve some first order mental state. And so the first order mental states might be identical across creatures, across between humans and elephants, say. But if, if having something be a reason to have that mental state, have that intention, have that feel grief, for example, then if, if that depended on, on self-consciousness, then you could have the same first order mental state in two different animals. And yet, and, it's, it's, and so the behavior could even be very, very similar because the mental state and its causal dispositions, right? As a, as a, as a, as a, a state of the mind, which disposes oneself to actions, those two mental states could be, the, could be the same in those respects. And yet still only one of them involves reasons or has a place in the space of reasons, um, despite that similarity. I sometimes wonder if if you could have mm, sometimes I wonder if you can have the same type of mental state if one doesn't relate that towards other types of reasons or beliefs that cohere together within another type of rational agent right because it seems as though even one or two or four or five beliefs might change uh, the sort of mental content of one's own beliefs res with respect to one sort of concrete particular event but I don't but I'm not quite sure myself um yeah that's interesting although that might run into some problems that might run into some problems anyways let's see if there's any more questions i'm not sure what the are you familiar with because one of the members said what about the problem of minimalism but i'm not familiar with the problem of minimalism like the problem of creeping minimalism, James Dreyer's uh, argument in metaethics. That I mean, it might it might be uh, it might universal be. discourse will have to tell us if that's what he means. Indeed. But in the meantime, guys, since we are about one hour and 30 minutes into this discussion, what I'd love to do, what we all love to do is remind our good old members here that they can and do have the ability of subscribing, especially if you have a uh, Twitch Prime account due to having an Amazon Prime account. Again, it only costs $5 to subscribe to this channel, which is just worth a cup of coffee for you guys. So if you enjoy this conversation with John, Let's 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 be honest, guys. This is a pretty good conversation. Then please, please, mm. please subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, is there is there so is there anything that you could tell us about? Since I'm looking at this title, integrity or identity or agency, with respect to what Coast Guard has to say, since I, I, we haven't quite gotten over all of those. What does she mean by integrity? How is that related to the agency? And what does exactly she mean by identity in this book? Yeah, sure. So uh, to, to, to build on what we've been talking about and, 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 get, in, and get into what integrity is for Chorus Guard, <clears throat> um, I would start by saying that uh, so we've been talking here about what it is that is constitutive of reasons. What is it that makes something into a reason? As you put it, makes it is what is necessary for for being a reason. Um, and I've been, as, as we've been going along, alluding to this idea that what is constitutive of, of something being a reason is that it is uh, self-consciously endorsed by the person for whom it is a reason for. Now, <clears throat> the basic idea here is that, and actually the, some of the, the posts that Agnes Domini has been making in the chat uh, indicate some of the lines of thought that Korsgaard takes on this, although I'll, I'll be actually setting aside the, the more sort of function ar argument or teleological way in which, in which she puts this, because I think the point that she's making is independent of any appeal to, to functions. But the basic idea of her account is that we, as, we, we have a certain capacity, which is a capacity for self-consciousness, or a capacity to not only be conscious of something, as I am when I perceive a, a glass, when I believe that you know, Obama was president of the United States, when I want to go get some ice cream, we're not only capable of consciousness of other things, we are capable of, of consciousness of our own, of our own consciousness of other things. And that capacity for 
self-consciousness provides us with, uh, on her view, and I won't provide the arguments for this, but the basic idea is that that capacity for self-consciousness is constitutive not only of something being a reason for us, because our consciousness of some state uh, can only, or a state can, something can only be a reason for us, you know, a desire, for example, can only provide us with reasons insofar as we uh, are conscious of our desiring it and endorse it, endorse that desire, uh, the desire of which we are conscious. But more than that, it, it more than just making things re into reasons, it also is what makes us one person across time. It's also the basis for the persistence of the self and indeed just, just, just the self in each moment as well. And so that's where the identity comes into and comes into the picture here. Um, but more so than that, what this what, what this entails is that self-consciousness, in order for self-consciousness to provide a basis for reasons, in order for us to uh, for something to become a reason for us by our self-conscious endorsement, by our reflective endorsement, it must be the case that 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 the endorsement, so the thing being endorsed is compatible with our continued existence across time that we can in other words continue to endorse that mental state or that thing which is a reason um as we continue to exist so some and, level of of continuity right one well actually this is sort of challenged in the theories of rationality but one of the sort of criterions of rationality is that we um our our, our beliefs have to be continuous uh that is that we can't just suddenly believe in p uh for one or five seconds right that wouldn't be sufficient for some theorists of rationality to say that we're rational we'd have to have some sort of continuity principle of which beliefs are endure for some sort of fuzzy length period of time but nonetheless for a, a very very long time um until we have at least good reasons to give up on it yeah, and we might say that such that that kind of continuity is a is the sort of uh, first order or dispositional basis for our capacity to have continuity across time self consciously that we would need that kind of continuity, like the actual persistence of dispositional states like belief states in order for us to uh, be able to have continuity of the self through self conscious uh, recognition of the continuity of the self you know through a continued endorsement of those beliefs for example or other attitudes um but one of the however much that kind of psychological continuity is uh is is required for continuity of the self and for a continued uh endorsement of something as a belief or as an attitude or as an intention and so on as a desire um, the, uh, the idea here is that it's only through that action of self-conscious endorsement that such psychological continuity becomes not just psychological continuity, not just a continued existence of a disposition in a particular physical object, but actually becomes a, uh, identity of the, the continuity of the self of, of, a, of, a, of a, of the kind of creature that we are across time, that it's only through this further action, which goes on top of the psychological continuity, um, if the psychological continuity is even necessary, which seems plausible, but um, it, it's only with that further action that we are, we are, we exist across time as a single creature of the sort that we are uh, as, as a, conti as a continue continued, continued so, so, existence. Of so what is this further fact that establishes continuity, if not psychology? Are you, are you, are you, are you endorsing some sort of transcendental capacity or something? Uh, no, it's, it's actually more of, it's more that the, the action itself, the act of self-consciousness is the further thing that is necessary so that it wouldn't be enough that you continued to hold a belief across time, that wouldn't be enough to constitute the identity of the self across time. What would be needed is the the continuation of your endorsement of that mm. mental state. 
Okay. But it's it's precisely the act of endorsing. Right, and, and you're distinguishing the act of self consciousness. Yeah, you're 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 making a distinction between the act of endorsement and the endorsement itself, right? Yeah, this is this is yeah. this is fairly common. Actually, you know, this act not, uh, content distinction is sometimes what creates a great deal of confusion, I think, within. Mm. And I don't want to I don't want to get too far into this uh, between people who really misunderstand what it means for conceptual content to exist or like experience into some way existing within the world because they confuse the act of experiencing or the act of you know conceptualizing with the content itself and mm -hmm. and then you get into psychologisms and all sorts <laughs> of great uh you know all sorts of great problems uh with subjective idealism if you don't if you don't see the distinction between these two so i just kind of wanted to bring that up real quick yeah interesting huh. um so I'm not. So did you did you actually talk about what is integrity? Um, I know you talked no, about not identity quite. and agency, but I didn't hear too much about integrity there. Yeah. So the idea here is that it's not just any act of self conscious reflection which can provide a basis for identity across time and provide a basis for our agency for free action, you know, acting beyond just acting on inclinations. Um, <clears throat> the idea is that it's, it's only and I, I, I sort of mentioned part of this, or at least started, started to, it's only uh, acts of that kind of reflective endorsement which can be maintained as actions. We can continue to repeat that action, in other words, uh, across time, which is able to uh, provide the grounds for agency and, and identity across time. And so what this requires is a kind of, is basically what Korsgaard broadly describes as the integrity of the agent or the integrity of a self-conscious creature where the all of the different endorsements that the agent the agent has made so in other words all of the the things that this person has committed to are able to not only coexist but are able to coexist with possible future commitments that the agent makes and so if and if it doesn't, so precisely what, what Merritt's calling this integrity of uh, integrity is that the agent quite literally falls apart. The person quite literally falls apart psychologically, insofar as they lack this quality of coherence amongst all their commitments and po and coherence with possible future commitments, um, because they're drawn, they're pulled in all these different directions. They cannot actually continue to maintain the very thing which ensures their continuity of, of, of their of their of the self across time okay is integrity the same thing as being authentic a la heidegger that's an interesting question because i do think that there is a close connection uh between the kind of integrity that korsgaard has in mind and the kind of authenticity that existentialists and heideggerian and such as Heide heidegger and Sartre um, regard as so central to, their, to ethics. Um, I don't. Korsgaard herself certainly does not connect it in any way to what ex, what, what Heidegger at least says. Um, but she does see it as intimately tied up with uh, what we might call being authentic in a more generic sense, namely. Um, not only doing something because you uh, make yourself do it, let's say by some sort of act of self-consciousness where you endorse something and then thereby make yourself do it, but specifically where there's a harmony between that action and your, uh, your, your feelings and your emotional state, your, the, the, the sort of the more emotional side of yourself. Um, where so you're not just reflectively endorsing something but you're reflectively endorsing that thing authentically like you, you genuinely feel strongly and uh are genuinely care about the thing which you are endorsing so there's some connection there i mean she doesn't really she's more concerned about the the nature of the act of the act of endorsement the the nature of um Uh, what is constitutive of agency? What is constitutive of self-consciousness? Then, then this connection to authenticity, this connection between the self-consciousness and the, the lower order consciousness, such as you get in your emotions and so on. 
So the idea of authenticity, as I take it a lot, Heidegger is probably, and, and I'd need to, I guess, know a little bit more about integrity, it has very little to do with ethics, unfortunately. And so I'm mm. not sure if they're going to be synonymous in any sort of relevant sense, because authenticity for Heidegger is going to relate to a lot of other types of um, existential notions, particularly related to his um, existential analytic of Dasein. Hmm. Uh, it's going to relate to oneself, how one uh, how one relates to one's death that is being onto death, how one one what ought to do for himself or for herself instead of necessarily what one ought to ethically do for oneself. As I recall reading from Heidegger, the notion of obligation or propositional commandments of any sort that we need to follow for for ethics seemed for Heidegger bankrupt. Um, I think maybe, and I'm not maybe enough of a Heideggerian scholar to say if this is true or not, but the idea entirely of categorical norms might be bankrupt for Heidegger. Hmm. Uh, so I, I personally think that this is a giant flaw um, of Heidegger's, if that is true. Um, if it's not true, I would, I would definitely like to see how that sort of tension is resolved because, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, he always talks about oneself, one's own existential commitment towards their death. There's very little about ethics and being in time or in some of his other works that I have read, and it's not too, too much. Um, so yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't have, I don't have too much more to say on that, on, on that issue with respect to ethics. I often have the same worries with many of the existentialists, other than Simone de Beauvoir. I think her ethics of ambiguity nicely avoids those kinds of concerns, but I, I share, I definitely share your, your worries. Yeah, I mean, I guess for the other existentialists, if we want to get on the topic, I mean, I even have this worry, although I'm not sure, I think it might be sort of a mistake to worry about this too much with certain people like Soren Kierkegaard, who have a sort of suspension of the ethical with the teleological, um, sort of the teleological notion of amending the ethical for the future, uh, generally a, sort of to reconcile their being with the ultimate authority who is, who's God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for someone like Heidegger, or sorry, not Heidegger, but Kierkegaard, you know, you have within, say, um, the sickness onto death, this relationship with, um, oh God, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, I'm losing the name for some reason from the Bible, Bible verse, uh, Isaac um, mm -hmm. and Abraham. Um, so this relationship that Abraham has with God is, is obviously not necessarily of an ethical species that's going to be uh, amendable to, uh, let's say, the, the categorical imperatives that we have in human reasoning. Um, they're going to be of their own specific type for Kierkegaard to where we have to amend uh, or jettison our ethical notions because God is an ultimate authority that if he does personally speak with us and reveal himself in such and such way, then any sort of ethical um, structures that we have have to be jettisoned in virtue of those. But a lot of people think that this is going to be a way of you know, committing heinous actions and being able to do whatever we want to in the name of Christianity, which I think is a sort of misunderstanding of Kierkegaard, because the idea is not to reconcile the, um, the teleological or the, the subjective, and at least in the subjective within the sort of union with God, with the ethical to begin with. Um, there is no falsification criterion of when we're acting from one or the other. There is no way of trying to rationalize those types of things. Um, and not something that we should necessarily confuse those two things as being. Um, so there might be some sort of concern in Heidegger, uh, in Kierkegaard. I'm not sure if there necessarily is. Um, and as with the other existentialists, I'm not quite sure since I haven't read enough Sartre to say. And with Heidegger, it just seems a little bit more apparent to me that he doesn't really have much of an ethical structure within any of his works as mm -hmm. far as I know. Uh, and then you maybe have people like 
Simone de Bois and Camus, who I have absolutely no clue about. Uh, it's not people that I research. So. Yeah, I'm interested in, in de Beauvoir's work, but yeah, I'm, I'm also not particularly uh, familiar with Camus. I'm somewhat, de Beauvoir accuses Sartre of not having, I can't remember where she says this, but of not uh, allowing for ethical considerations within his existentialism, within his, his existentialist commitments. Um, but, and, I, and from what I understand of Sartre on my own, I think that seems to be the case, much as you described for Heidegger. Um, Bernard Williams, incidentally, is an existentialist, um, more in a sort of Nietzschean tradition, um, and certainly is a case of this as well, where he doesn't leave room for ethics beyond, I mean, he of course leaves room for ethics, what we might more broadly call ethics. And, it's, and of course, this is true of Sartre and, and others, but it's, it's as we were describing before, in ethics, which is dependent on your existential commitments. It's dependent on what you, what you authentically uh, accept and what you authentically care about. Yeah, I guess with Nietzsche, since I didn't think about Nietzsche too much as an existentialist, I see a little bit more ground for ethics. He, I, I, I'm not sure if I would call him an ethical relativist as much as like an ethical particularist. But then mm -hmm. it becomes very difficult to do ethics under that type of framework because um, you have no sort of prescriptive notions. You have no sort of categorical notions. And I think he was very aware of that. I think he thought that this was a sort of detriment of ethics. Whether mm -hmm. he misunderstood uh, categorical norms is, is a sort of another question. I guess that gets us into the stage of not meta ethics, but normative ethics. Do you have any sort of, um, if you want to change the subject, I guess, for a, for a little bit, any sort of sure. uh, normative ethics that you sort of prescribe to? I mean, do, do you subscribe to some form of deontology? No, I would describe myself as a, as a moral particularist. Okay. Who, in, who sees the particular obligations that we have, the sort of contextually, the context-sensitive obligations that we have uh, as coming out of uh, what the conditions for virtuous character are. And and how do you reconcile that with categorical norms of any sort? Do you, do you just think that categorical norms are always going to be in a, some, in a some sense particular? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Can you, yes. kind of, can you kind of spell out exactly how that might work for you? Yeah, so the the basic idea here is that whenever the precisely the things that can act as categorical norms are always going to be maxims as Kant puts it and that we might just more colloquially call intentions and these maxims uh the ones that are capable of being categorical norms have to have a certain internal structure namely a um a uh end means context structure so for example m my maxim could be i will drink from this glass when I am thirsty. And that would capture the end and the means. I, you know, I, will, I will drink from the sorry, this I will drink from this glass to satisfy my thirst. So that will that will capture the end and the means. But if but that can only be a maxim when it's contextualized, which is to say that although that would not be explicitly in the maxim, the, the for example, the fact that what's that there's liquid in the glass, that the liquid isn't poisonous, that the liquid isn't owned by someone else or something like that. Um, those features of the maxim are uh, features of the context in which I act on that maxim, but which con features which are always implicit in, in the maxim and in my perception, we might say, of the context in, under, un, under which I act on that maxim. And that what, insofar as that maxim can be, ca uh, ca uh, can satisfy the categorical imperative, um, it must be the case that it can be, and it's something that I, I haven't talked too much about universalization in Kant, but the basic, but, but um, the basic idea being that that maxim has to be able to be, uh, you know, to put in the language I used earlier, comp uh, a, a maxim that I can continue to endorse across time and across future possible 
um, across across future possible situations I might encounter. I mean, like, that's that's the kind of universalizability that's at issue in Kant. But um, the maxim itself, so the thing that's being universalized in that way, that has to be able to be reflectively endorsed across all of these, you know, across time and across future possible situations, and indeed across persons, which is something I've gotten into. But um, it's it's it, the maxim which is being universalized in that way is a contextualized maxim. It is a, I will do this for the sake of that in this context. And so in that way, all of the things that are normative for us are normative within their proper context, basically. And in that way, the um, the actual reasons that we have are always irreducibly contextual. They're, they're not something which could be captured in um, universal principles that are non-formal. Hmm. So the only universal principle that there would be would be a formal principle, which is context independent, but that formal principle can only have uh, can only provide norms if you put material into that form, right? If you if you have an actual maxim that is structured according to that formal principle, and so all the maxims that can actually act as reasons, so all the things that can be reasons for us, will always be contextual, despite the universality of the of the, the fundamental moral principle. I see. So so in this sense, you're sort of you're comfortable with historicizing the content of our judgment. Uh, but the judgment sink still being in its form uh, categorical, right? So exactly. You're, so you're you're saying the content is necessarily categorical. The content is historical. The form is necessarily categorical. The content is necessarily historical. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's somewhere where I would be comfortable with with meta ethics. It's not something that I'm too structured about because it always seemed silly to be you know to actually legitimately believe in something like um you know the uh the categorical imperative as, as kant put it um mm. unless you you seem to dis disagree with that it, it seems to me at least that we'd want to be um amendable to the sort of historical norms that we're participating in or otherwise you're not doing really much in terms of ethics right there's so many things that are historically contingent in virtue of how we seem to participate in norms where we have to be sort of particularist about it and and these seem to be also sort of the criticisms that we generally see or at least i see in heidegger of kantian ethics or hegelian ethics which mm -hmm. might be you know a misunderstanding i think of the categorical norms that we see within the early german uh, idealist tradition that just because we have to have categorical norms of something or that we prescribe ourselves to something, that these can't be in turn historical um, in, in yeah. any sort of sense. And that, that sort of might be a mildly irritating thing for an ethicist such as yourself to come across. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, yeah. I, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think that, that that indeed is something that I do find quite quite frustrating actually when when talking about ethical theories especially when talking about Kant, Kantian ethics I mean um, precisely because there seems people assume that there is this tension between having a universal principle having this um, having some universal basis to uh, all of our moral obligations and having reasons which are historically contextualized and historically sensitive and sensitive to the actual you know institutions society that we that we live in um, and I, it's frustrating precisely because I, I see it as resolved within the Kantian system. It's, it's, it's precisely the universality is just the form of the moral obligation. And then the historical context is the content. It's the thing, it's the thing which is put under that form. And you can't have moral obligations unless you have form and content. You can't have, uh, reasons in general unless well i mean let's just say moral reasons you can't have moral reasons without uh, merely on you know merely on the basis of that formal principle like even if the principle is true you could never have it could, it could never give you an obligation or give you a reason if it were not given some content 
if that form were not given to some content. And so in that way, there just sort of is this inseparability within the Kantian system between universal morality and historical contingency. And that seems to be in par with the idea of intuitions without concepts or um, are empty and concepts without intuitions are blind, right? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, let me see. You're down. Okay. Um, so yeah, let's see if we can tie this on to any Q&A within the audience and sort of wrap up this ethical discussion at least. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if you guys want to start um, asking some sort of questions about anything that we've talked about um, among the audience members, I know there's a lot less questions going on here right now than there were originally. So if there aren't, we might move on to some other issues. Is there... Uh, while we wait for that, is there anything that in particular that you wanted to talk uh, about, John, uh, that isn't ethics or did you did, about ethics, I guess, if you particularly wanted to talk about those? Um, I was debating whether I want to continue some of the stuff we were discussing last time, um, but maybe not today. Yeah. Um, I, I think I, I'm pretty, I, uh, there's certainly so much more to say. I, I almost just don't know what to suggest, given that there is. I, I could just arbitrarily pick any any particular direction to go in. Um, but I, I actually, I do want to answer a question that was there earlier, which I uh, we were in the middle of a conversation when I saw it, so I didn't I didn't jump on it. But someone was asking what order to, I think it was Agnes Domini, was asking what order to read these books in. And in, I, I would say go for it in any order. I would suggest probably not reading Kant first, given the complexity and the ease how easily, uh, how easy it is to, to misunderstand or um, be confused by by Kant and the way that he writes. Um, I would say that the Bernard Williams is the easiest read, and it is is very clear. It, it, he's he's a, he's very attentive to the actual lived situation of decision making and the way in which we engage with morality, and so it's a wonderful book just to read uh, in its own right. And the Corps Guard is, how, is, however, maybe something which is better to read with some background in Kant. Um, but that said, I think is actually quite a bit easier to read than Kant himself. So I would probably recommend reading that before before reading Kant. But um, certainly, there the these books are. I think all worth reading in whatever order you would want to read. You would want to read them. Yeah, I think generally I, I find this sort of this pattern to be you know, indicative of a lot of philosophy. I mean, we often get asked, where, do, where does one begin in philosophy? Um, yeah. And what might be the best sort of starting path? And the general answer that I think that, and I, I've sort of discussed this with other people, um, on this very issue, the sort of general answer I, I see there is kind of like sort of frag, not not fragmented, I guess by by. I would say I would give it. Let me phrase it this way: I would I would I would give two answers, right? Because two answers seem sort of just equally as satisfying. It doesn't really matter where one starts. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think one needs to necessarily read Socrates or Plato or Hume or Kant, although I I I am a huge fan of Kant. And I, I, I think that that's it's a very nice area to be in, but I don't know if you necessarily need that in order to have other accounts of metaphysics or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, so really starting anywhere and then getting sort of, especially uh, anywhere at least within uh, maybe analytic books or con contemporary continental books uh, is just as a, as a far, is a fair starting point as any other ones are. Uh, and when it comes to historical books, right, the same thing can be said as long as you probably get some sort of well-known guides to this mm -hmm. to this book. And, you know, we've already done some sort of suggestions where one can possibly begin with, in the, with Kant and the Critique of Pure Reason and then the uh, Bird secondary guide that you mentioned. And I think yeah. this is basically within anywhere. You know, you can start with Heidegger if you want to. That's a little bit less recommended by me. And you could read someone mm -hmm. like um, King and uh, or her guide to being in time or Simon Critchley's guide to being in time or uh, a less popular one might be Lee Bravers or even a less popular might, one might be Herbert Dreyfus, which I actually do not um, suggest, but some people really like that analytic interpretation of Kant. Um, 
Hmm. Um, and then the second answer to this question, which I think is just just about as good, is maybe beginning somewhere in the beginning and then seeing how the hermeneutics plays out from there going uh, to the future. The only problem with that is that you're going to be doing a lot of historical work, yeah, and 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 not and you're not going to be able to get answers anytime or really satisfying answers until later on where all these old accounts get transformed into ordinary typical language which is very concise and you know um, structured in a way that works well within a say a dialectic with other people um, that's the, the largest problem that I actually had doing a lot of history of philosophy before I read you know contemporary works is like where do I situate this this history in, in contemporary in contemporary language and exactly when I read Kant before reading the second literature is like, well, what exactly is Kant epistemically? You know, is he a coherentist? Is he a foundationalist? Is he an anti-foundationalist? He says a lot of, you know, cool things, but it's, he never precisely situates himself um, into any of these contexts is something that you're going to have to make a set of inferences in order to determine, at least for mm -hmm. some of the things. I mean, you know, there are things which are kind of clear and, and plain, you know, uh, that you know he might be some form of representationalist he might be some form of um idealist not definitely not a subjective idealist but you know at least in some minimal sense an idealist so so yeah um uh let's see yeah i, I don't see i don't think we're getting any more questions unless you want to answer the do you endorse abortion and nope. uh, <laughs> i do not want to answer that question <laughs> Yeah, that's a, this is more on practical ethics. I think I have answered this question before, and I'm actually pro-choice, and I was pro-life for a while, um, and it's still rather ambiguous for me whether I choose one or the other. I'm only pro-choice because of a few articles that I've read recently that have made it sort of apparent to me that the defining issue in abortion um, isn't whether or not the fetus is a human life um, or has agency, a subjectivity of any sort of, that's important, or if you if you prefer the word personhood. Um, even if we manage to somehow epistemically settle that or ontologically settle that, it doesn't seem mm -hmm. like it matters too much because there are going to be certain types of feminists which are going to argue that regardless of this issue, um, choice sort of wins out at the end of the day because of all these different types of thought experiments that we can put forth like the violin experiment or sorry the violin um story that narrative yeah. and then also other narratives like you know what if one could get impregnated by certain types of things like hypothetical examples which are absurd but nonetheless kind of interesting thought experiments like what would if what if you know people could get impregnated like um as if a seed could come through the window like um, like dandelions can, right? And that leads to sort of interesting thought experiments which which lead to the idea that maybe choice is more important than we think. Um, but we're not getting into those right now. I did have a debate with Destiny on this very issue that if you guys are really mm -hmm. interested is on YouTube somewhere, Marty, Destiny debate, and I'm sure Rem was in there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I guess... Um, <laughs> someone's booing me agnes uh. booing me for having a pro-choice uh stance this is okay we can talk about that later in person agnes since i uh since i know agnes um uh yeah so did you have any sort of concluding remarks john or, um anything else that you want to talk about or should we wrap it up here i know you you kind of have other things to do here soon yeah maybe I'll, maybe i'll just um throw in as a sort of non-response -re kind of addressing the you know, should abortion be, abortion be permissible question. Um, I'll say that one upshot of the particularism in normative ethics that I endorse is that any of the, any kind of moral issue is something that should be solved by careful attention and reflection on the particular features of the context in which you're taking the action, which is to say that I, I, I'm in general skeptical of universal answers to moral questions. Yes, yeah, and I, I, I think that's something which is, uh, was certainly a consequence, a consequence of particularism. Kind of just is what particularism is, 
but also it's, I think, an upshot in many ways, because I think it's often, I mean, I'd go so far as almost to say it's often pernicious to come to these sorts of uh, prior judgments on what is right or wrong, and to simply apply those kinds of uh, universal principles to any given context that you run in, any particular situation that you then run into, rather than doing the reverse, which is more to enter into the particular situation of choice, whatever that situation is, and then, you know, attentively and emotionally engage with the actual features of, of the situation. Okay, okay. Well, um, thank you for that, John. Thank you for being on again with me here. I'm sure everyone enjoyed this this talk as usual. We definitely had a lot more members this time around than um, than last time. We've had, a, mm -hmm. I think, a, a, a good continuous approximation, about 30, 36 people. Yeah. Definitely thank you to, um, I hope I'm not mispronouncing it, Baidu, Baidu's, Bidzud, Bidzud for uh, bringing 23 people on here that contributed initially to having around 55 or so people here originally. Oh, wow. Yeah, he definitely deserves a shout out for that. Uh, as a matter of fact, if he ever wants to come on here and have a talk with us, he's definitely more than welcome to for doing that. Um, as um, as for the original conversation that I was supposed to have here, guys, at 8 p.m. with Daniel, he looks like he had to reschedule that, which isn't necessarily bad. So we'll have to reschedule the conversation with Daniel on uh, on normative ethics. It's not going to be so much meta ethics as normative ethics with Daniel, since he's a professor of ethics. Uh, and that conversation is going to happen on Thursday instead of today at 8 p.m. So it's going to be Thursday, 8 p.m. We might avoid, unless someone comes up to the table, the typical 2 p.m. conversation on Thursday. Instead, just bring it up to 8 p.m. Uh, 8 p.m. S uh, uh, sorry CST time with uh, Daniel on um, on normative ethics. So, uh, yeah, once again, thank you for um, coming on, John. Thank you guys for all being here. Yeah. I will see, see you all. Um, I will see you all uh, Thursday at 8 p.m. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks, everyone in the chat. Bye.